So it's already on, the recorder is on. So what I'm showing here is the uh, five-year trend of the uh, per share price of NVIDIA. And you can see how it has changed over time. So when at the very beginning, like six years ago, this is 200. So I'm going to say this is, you know, this is 100. This is about 50. So it's less than 50, okay? You know, probably around 30, 40-ish, okay? Um, and then it gradually go up a little bit. Um, the end of 2022 is when ChatGPT 3.5 was released, okay? And that changed everything right here you can go like whoop, whoop, whoop. and then right here it just went all the way up here so this is from about 400 and 500 bucks all the way shot all the way up to more than 800 dollars so it's still more than 800 dollars per share so that means you know people who bought you know like a bunch of shares like <clears throat> six five years ago you know, as long as they hold on to those shares, you know, they're making a pretty good sum of money. The big question is you know, whether it can continue this trend. And you know, anything that looks you know, like this, you know, this kind of slope, is very, very abnormal. That is just not normal at all. So, but the, the trend of, this, of the uh, per share price of NVIDIA, I think it shows you something about the industry, generally speaking, um, because it, can, it kind of shows you, you know, what, uh, what is in demand, okay? Because you know, otherwise, you know, there won't be any change to, it won't be dramatic changes to the per share price of a, of a particular company. The company is now worth, uh, I think it mentioned somewhere, yeah, $2.16 trillion. And that's a lot of money. Now it's just worth you, know, so that's kind of virtual. So unless you know somebody, you know, unless the company you know, sells out all the shares, it's all money on, in theory. Okay, it's not actually on, you know, it's not actual money. But it is still kind of interesting. So um, related to this, okay, you might want to you know, check out these news too. You know, I'm not sure how many people actually went to uh, check out Slashdot. So you can look up, you know, AI companies getting into energy business. Yes, typo right there. Um, top 10 startup developing AI for energy efficiency because that's one of the limitations. You know, it's consuming a lot of energy. Uh, leading AI energy company in the power sector, and so on. AI needs so much energy that tech companies are getting into energy business. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm not sure about you, but this is fascinating to me, okay? Uh, because if you think about energy, who uses a lot of energy? You would think uh, refineries, okay? Um, companies that turn ore into steel, okay, because you're reversing the oxidation process and that takes a lot of energy. Um, you can think about, uh, um, is it called desalination? You know, taking the salt out of water, basic, huh? Yeah, so that takes a lot of energy too because you're basically boiling water and condensing it you know, to you know, get back to the water. Nope, AI is using a lot of energy. So that's, that's really interesting, okay? It really changes um, how I view, you know, the application of AI, you know, like what is the demand of, um, you know, the use of what we think, what we call AI these days. All right, so that's just news, okay? Slashdot is a really cool place, you know, if you want to kind of keep up with, you know, what is going on in the tech sector. Um, you know, it just has all kinds of, you know, subcategories if you are interested in software you know this is where you go and so on so i would suggest you guys to kind of check in with slash dot once in a while just to see what is going on just to get you know keep a pulse on you know tech related industries all right so i'm gonna get rid of this one and we are going to talk about the topic for today we have quite a bit of stuff to talk about today because we only have four classes left. 
one of which is going to be about the final exam. So we only really got three more classes to talk about new material. So you do have homework assignment. So I designated these two as homework assignment. They are due in a week. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of time to go through the material and a little bit of time to think through the, the programming. Okay, so this one is homework assignment. We are not gonna do it at the lab. So you have, you have plenty of time to do it on your own. We do have a lab today. So the lab that we are gonna do today has to do with structures. So basic structures is the one that we're gonna do today. Um, and we are now getting into structures and arrays, which you know, we also have you know, notes to refer to. So I'll just give in a moment. Um, so this is basically what we're gonna talk about today. Um, how, you know, what about structures and what about arrays and so on. So we're gonna focus on just structures. Um, does anyone need a quick refresh of what a structure is? Okay, nobody, all right. So what we'll do is we are going to take, take a look at some programs written in C first, and then we'll do the usual thing which means I'm gonna write the C code, we'll take a look at the behavior of the C code, and then we'll translate that into assembly language code. Okay. So to do that, I'm gonna to switch to my command line interface, and I will make the font a little bit bigger, okay? So this way it's easier for everybody to look at the actual code. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna write a program that makes use of structures. So I'll just create a structure. Um, I'll call this x, okay, struct x, because there's no actual particular purpose to this structure other than for illustration purposes. And before that, I'm also going to pound include standard integer dot h, so I can refer to 8-bit integers. So now we have u int 8 underscore t, um, let's just have X, Y, and Z as members of this particular structure. That's it. So struct X does not consume any memory at all because struct X is a cookie cutter. And would anyone eat a cookie cutter? Would you? Since, we, since I don't see Bender here as one of our, my students, I don't think anyone in this class is going to eat a cookie cutter. Now, Bender may, but Bender, as in the character in Futurama, may actually eat a cookie cutter. But you guys are humans. You don't eat cookie cutters. You eat cookies, right? So we're going to take a look at how we make cookies in this case. So we have a local, um, we have a function main, and function main has a local variable that, has, that is of struct x type. And I'm just going to call this one mm, ABC, OK? So ABC is the name of a variable. The variable has a type of struct X. Are we doing okay so far with the concepts? Does everybody know the difference between what is the name X, uppercase X, referring to and what is ABC referring to, how they're related and how they're not the same thing? Yes. because this is plain C and X is not a class. Now, if X was a class in C++, then X is all you need. But since this is regular C, which is not C++, and X is a struct and not a class, this is the proper syntax to say that ABC is of the type struct X, which is equivalent, more or less, to class X, if you will. <clears throat> Are we still doing okay so far with the structure? So X refers to the name of a cookie cutter, and I decide to cut a cookie and name the cookie ABC. Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to make a really kind of dumb you know, subroutine here. We'll just say init zero, and it takes the pointer of an unsigned ABIT integer, P, and all it wants to do is to say whatever P is pointing to is now zero. That's all it's gonna do. And over here, I want to do a few things. 
So the first thing is, of all the members of ABC, where's my mouse pointer? Right there, okay. So of all the members of ABC, uh, okay, member Y is gonna be initialized to a zero explicitly, or let's make it a five. But for member Z, I'm gonna call the function to do it. So I'm gonna call init zero, and I'm gonna pass along ABC, the address of ABC dot, um, what did I say, X or Z? Huh? Z, okay, so we'll pass along the address of member Z of the structure ABC as a variable to the function init zero so that it can do the initialization for me. All right, um, let's see. Oh, we can do something else here. We can say X has exactly the same value as Y, okay? So we'll do that and then return zero, okay? So before we move on, does everybody understand in terms of theory what this program is going to do? What each line is going to do and what each statement is trying to specify. So we're good, all right. So we'll go ahead and actually run the C code just to make sure that it does run the way we expect it to run and then we'll go ahead and <coughs> look into the assembly language version. But, okay, so I'm gonna save the code. You don't have to frantically copy the code. You know, uh, at the end of the class, I will, once again, you'll zip up the C code and also the assembly code and share that with you guys, okay? So you can focus on the concept and no, not so much you're, you're trying to copy everything down. All right, so I'm gonna get out of the editor and then we'll use gcc-g-o struct struct.c. This is just me running the compiler on the command line. gdb struct. So now the program is running. Not a very complicated program, but I'm gonna put a breakpoint on line 15, which is the first line that does anything useful. And we get to over here. So one thing I want to know is a few things. Okay, there are a few things I want to know. First, how big is ABC? How, ma how many bytes of memory is ABC as a variable consuming? So fortunately, there is an operator called size of. How many people have heard about size of as an operator? Okay, very good. So we're gonna say, what is the size of? And what you can specify inside size of can be a type. In other words, I can type struct X here, but I can also specify ABC, which is a variable of the type struct X. So they both will work and give me exactly the same answer. So first method, specify the type. It tells me each struct X consumes or takes up three bytes. Does that surprise you? No, because it has X, Y, Z as members and each one is an A-bit unsigned integer, okay? So together they take up three bytes. Okay, cool. And just to be sure that we can also do this, We'll give it a try, okay? All right, so next thing is to check out the addresses. So if I say, where is ABC, okay, what is the address of ABC? Eh, it gives me some mumbo jumbo here because you know, this is a, a single memory location, you know, a byte location in RAM on the stack, and it is blah, 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 seven, F, 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 you know, and it ends with three D. So, the first question is, if I were to ask, where is the first member of variable ABC, which is of the type struct X, where do you think that is? Same address, exactly, okay? So it's kind of like asking, here's a piece of cookie, okay? It has like three lumps in it, and you know, so when you are trying to eat the cookie, you go like, I like the first lump, or I like the second lump, I like the third lump, okay? Because the first lump has chocolate chip, the second one has raisins, and the last one has almond, okay? So now you go like, yeah, okay, I can see that face. So, so you know, which one you want to eat first, you kind of go like, eh, maybe one of these, okay? But remember, the one with chocolate chip is the first lump. So when I say, oh, you can find that cookie at this coordinate on the table, okay? I'm referring to the lowest location of the entire cookie, which has three lumps. So if I want to ask, but where's, where's the first lump of that cookie? It's the same place. It is at exactly the same place as the entire cookie. Does that make sense? Okay, 
So when I ask, where is member X uh, as a member of ABC, then it goes like, well, yep, at exactly the same place, okay? Blah, 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 3D, and blah, 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 3D. So it's not really surprising because it is the first item or the first member or the first component of the entire structure. It is not surprising that it is at the very beginning of the entire structure, okay? But the types are different, okay? So when you look at the types, one is of the type of a pointer to a struct X. The other one is of the type of a pointer to an unsigned A-bit integer. But that part is not surprising either because, as, because C++ is a strongly typed programming language, which means everything has a type associated with it. And whatever the pointer points to also has a type associated with it. Is that okay? All right. So I'm going to ask a question that you probably already know what the answer is. What do you think is the address of Y? Just name the last two hexadecimal digit. 3E, right? It's the next location. Okay, so let's check it out. Yep. And of course, you know, when we get to Z, it is just 3F, okay, which is the last of the location. Is that okay so far? All right. So this is really important to us, okay, because the objective of writing functions in assembly language is not by itself particularly useful, okay? In other words, you are unlikely to have to write an entire program all in assembly language. Not even the operating system, okay? If you look into Linux as an operating system, only a small percentage of the code is actually written in completely assembly code. The rest is mostly written in C and not really C++, okay? Um, so the idea of writing functions in, C, in assembly language is there are just certain things you cannot express using the C programming language, and then you have to drop down to assembly language. But you want to make that function to be accessible from C as well. So that means when you need to access your structures, arrays, and all kinds of stuff like that, you have to play by the rules of the C compiler. However the C compiler looks at the structure is however your assembly code has to play with. Okay, because you, because you are trying to have interoperability between C code and assembly code. Okay, so this is all kind of important. <clears throat> so now we get back to, let's put a value of five into member Y of the uh, variable ABC, single step. So you can print ABC as a whole, so now we can see that you know, y has a value of five. X has x is not initialized, so it's, this is just whatever leftover value is in at that location. And z is also what well, is coincidentally it has a uh, a byte that is already zero. So what I'll do is I can say um, set var abc dot z equals to something other than zero because I want to see the effect of init zero. So we'll set it to some other value, something other than zero, let's say three. So when I print ABC again, member Z is now a three. This is before we call init zero. So now I perform a single step into init zero. So we are already in init zero, and you can see the parameter passed to init zero ends with a three F, which coincidentally or not coincidentally, is the address of member Z of the structure ABC. Is that okay? All right, so now I perform this operation, single step, and I want to know, so if everything works the way we expect it to work, member Z of ABC of main should now be zero, very good. Okay, so we're gonna use the trick that we did last time we do a backtrack, which is not really necessary because we know exactly where we are in terms of the frame numbers. So we do a frame one to switch back to the frame of main. And now we can say print ABC because now we are within the context of main, not of init zero anymore. And you can see that ABC.Z is now a zero because whatever P is pointing to is exactly Z of ABC. Is that okay? Because we passed it as an argument to init zero. Okay, 
So now we back, get back to frame zero, which is uh, init zero. <clears throat> Single step, okay, we get back to the um, main, and then we single step again, and when we print ABC again, we should see 550 five, as the three members. That's exactly what we are seeing. So that's how the C code operates. But in the discussion of how the C code operates, I also talked about the addresses of members of a structure. Are we doing okay so far? All right, okay. So this is the sample program, and we want to write this entire program in assembly. So we will get out of the debugger, and we are gonna use dash o, o vim, dash o struct dot c, struct dot ttpasm. On the left hand side we have the C code, which we just ran, and then on the right hand side is the assembly code that we are writing right now. So we do the typical stuff, okay, just to get it out of the way. No op, you know, initialize the stack pointer, um, and then do a LDI A.6 plus, which I explained in the previous class. Decrement D, ST, DA, which is pushing the return address on the stack, JMPI to main, because I'm treating main as an actual you know, function, so I'm calling main from the uh, entry code of the entire program, and when it comes back, I don't have anything else to do, and therefore it's just a halt. So now I can work with init zero. So init zero, the first thing you want to do whenever you write any program is to figure out the three, the two main parts of the call frame. There are, okay, I got the uh, tablet running this time, so we can use the tablet. So I think this picture can be particularly helpful for those of you who are more visual. All right, so the way this works is whatever is up points to high memory address, whatever is down points to low memory address. Okay, that's just my convention of you know, looking at your know, memory locations. So whenever you look at a call frame, a call frame is basically a chunk of memory that provides the context for function to operate. Do we have any questions about that? Let me repeat that statement. A call frame is a chunk of memory on the stack that provides the context for a function to operate. Yes. There'll be stuff above or below, okay? But typically, uh, the stuff that is, if you, yeah, so you can you can assume there are things you know, above and below, but if you're in that function itself, then there should be nothing below it. All right, so there are three distinct sections in the call frame, okay? So let's say we put you know, one line here. This is the return address. The return address is the only one thing that has to be in the call frame. Because without that, the function cannot return to the caller. So this one thing, this one byte in TTP, you know, has to be there when you call a function because it needs it in order to return. What is above it? These are your arguments. If there are any, because some functions may not have any arguments. This is gonna be the last argument and this is going to be the first argument when you look at the source code in C from left to right. The reason why the last argument is at the highest memory location is because we push the last argument first, and then we work to our, our way back to the first argument, and then we push the return address. That is, those are all res the responsibility of the caller. In other words, these are the responsibility of the caller to put those things on the stack. And the question is, what about the other things? What about these things? These are your local variables. Okay, so your local variables are basically below where the return address is, and these are all allocated by the callee. So the callee is responsible to allocate and also to deallocate those particular things, which are your local variables. And after you allocate all of your local variables, the stack pointer points to the very last location that you allocate. 
So that's where the start point is pointing to, you know, once the entire core frame is set up from the function's perspective. Do we have any questions about this diagram, this picture? I just thought that this might be helpful, okay? Yeah, because you know, that's generally speaking true for every single invocation of a function. Are we doing okay so far with this? Yes? All right. All right, so with this picture in mind, now we can kind of think about what about structures? How do structures fit into this? Well, it fits into this picture and it also does not fit into this picture. It all depends on where the structures are. Are the structures your global variables or are they your local variables? If the structure is a local variable, then it has to be allocated within this area here because it is, that's the region of all the local variables. If it is a global variable, eh, it's going to be somewhere else. Okay, we'll talk about global variables and where they should go, but not today. Okay, so today we'll focus on just local variables. So we still do okay so far with this. Now this picture is also helpful with all the other sample programs that I have written up to this point. So you can go back to all the other sample programs that I have written so far and draw this picture and be able to identify, okay, this particular function, when it's called, is gonna have these things as its parameters. This is gonna be the return address, and it's gonna have these as the local variables. Now, does it have to have local variables? No, a lot of functions may not have local variables. Does it have to have your parameters? No, some functions do not have parameters either. Okay, so both regions are optional. The return address is the only part that has to be there. Are we doing okay so far with this picture? All right, so we'll keep the picture, I'll keep the picture on the tablet, you know, when we need to go back and refer to it. So <clears throat> now we go back to the C code here. So we're looking at init zero. Init zero has a parameter. The parameter is called P, which is gonna be pushed first. And then we have the return address, which is pushed next, but it has no local variables. So that means when this is all done, when the call frame is all done, then the stack pointer would be pointing to the last thing that was pushed on the stack, which is the return address, because we don't have any local variables in this case. Is that okay? All right. But I don't want to have to remember, oh, P is one byte after the return address, which is where the stack pointer is pointing to. So what I do, okay, this is something that we have started to do from last time already, is I define a label. In this case, it is one. And this is the offset of where I can find parameter P, which in the notation that I use is the address of P minus the stack pointer. Because it is a relative, it's, an, it's the number of bytes between where the stack pointer points to, which is the return address, and where I can find the parameter P, which is one byte above it. So that's why the label is simply defined to be a one, because that's where I can find parameter P once the stack is all set up. Okay? This is also nothing new. I'm re-explaining, you, know, uh, you know, how the label is defined. So once we have this, we can start to write the code, but before I write the actual code, I am going to finish you know, the call first. I'm gonna do the return thing. The return thing is usually just you know, something like this. We're retrieving the return address from the stack because you know, we can see how the stack pointer is pointing to the return address. So when we retrieve whatever is the stack pointer pointing to, it is the return address. So we retrieve that to register B. And then we increment D. This is the one time, okay, where the caller is the one pushing it on the stack, allocating and initializing it. It is the callee that is deallocating it. Everything else, okay, if you're pushing it on the stack, you're responsible to clean it up, okay? But for the return address, it's the only exception where the caller puts it on the stack, the callee removes it from the stack, okay? So this is the only exception to that rule. And then we have a JMPB, which is you know, uh, basically copying register B to the program counter so that we continue execution at whatever register B is pointing to. 
So now we can go back in and finish up the rest of the program. The uh, zero, I'm not too concerned, so I just want to know, you know what P is pointing to, okay? So to do that, the first thing I do is <clears throat> I retrieve um, init zero underscore P. So this is just the offset. So A at this point is the address of P minus the stack pointer. Add AD. So I'm so if you follow the calculation, you can actually see it, right? Because we have this thing, this is what was in A originally, and I'm adding the stack pointer to it. So using your algebra, you can now see that, oh, so that's really just the address of P, which is great, okay? That's, that's what we need to get to what we need, what we want. So now we have a LD, AA, A, comma, A. So this one is A being the dereference of A. So that means we are dereferencing the address of P, and that's just the value of P. The value of P is not what we want to overwrite, because we want to overwrite whatever P is pointing to. Okay? So we need a we need one more dereference, but we don't do it yet because we need you know some register to be zero. So I'm gonna put the zero into register B. Okay, just to document here what this is, B is zero. And now finally we have this to finish up the entire operation. Because at this point on line 18, Register A has the address, okay, I take it back. Register A is parameter P, which points to the location that I need to initialize to zero. Register B, on the other hand, has just a zero in it, so by using the store instruction, I'm now overwriting whatever P is pointing to, to a zero, which accomplishes you know, line nine of the C code. Is that okay so far? All right, so we got, we're, we're gonna run this code through River Spider, which means there will be a trace left behind, and you know you guys can all take a snapshot of that. You know when you're you know using your cell phone, you can take a snapshot already. Okay, so so we'll do that when we are ready to do it. Okay, so this is init zero. Now we have main. So with main, we have no arguments. So that means the return address is at the top of the call frame because we don't have any um, parameters you know, before that or you know, at locations higher than the return address. And then we need to allocate for ABC. So that means you know, how many bytes do we need to allocate below the return address? Three, that's right, because it is the size of the variable ABC. So this is where we need to define some additional labels because in assembly language, there is no concept as a structure, okay? So we are gonna have to use some other concepts to kind of make up for you know, the definition of the structure. I'll put all, everything here. Where you put this definition is not important, okay? So you can, you can put all the label definitions all at one spot, you sprinkle everything all over the place. It does not matter, okay? So what I'm gonna do is to say, Okay, let's first define your know, x underscore x here. The first uppercase x refers to the name of the structure. The lowercase x refers to the member that I want to you know, address. So this is gonna be zero, but what this label is representing is the offset to member x from, okay, I'm gonna put really, really long comments here, the beginning from the first byte of the entire whew, structure. There we go. Okay, does everybody understand what the comments means? I know you probably can read every single word, but do you understand what the whole sentence means? Okay, so now we define x underscore y, which is you know, the offset to member y of the entire structure. I can just do this, okay, which is not what I prefer to do. So instead of doing this, I got, I'm gonna say this. The reason that why I say this is I also want the location or the offset to y to be relative to the offset of x. Because this way, if I choose to define any other members before x, I can, I, I won't have to change the definition of x. I don't have to change everything after that. Okay, so that's why I make everything relative 
Now, this one is refer referring to the size of x as a member. Now, since x is just a 8-bit unsigned integer, it only takes up one byte, and that's why there is a one here. And this is the postfix notation that we talked about in the previous class. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yep, there, there are some similarities here. Yep. That's the way I prefer to do it. So now we have x underscore z, which is right after y. And because y has one byte, and that's why we have a one plus here. And then on top of all of these, I have a size here. And that would be the offset to the last member plus the size of the last member. So x underscore size is a label that is representing if I need the entire structure x, how many bytes do I need? Well, in this case, it's exactly three bytes because x size is xz plus one, xz is xy plus one, xy is xx plus one, and xx is a zero. So it boils down to just three. The reason why I don't just type three and make it relative to the offset to the last member of the entire structure is if I choose to change the structure, I now only have to change some minimal change. I, 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 only, I only have to make minimal changes instead of changing every single label that is affected. So that's the reason why they're all relative to each other. All right, so with these definitions done, we now go back to here and go like, okay, so how many bytes do I need to allocate here? Well, let me first take a look at you know, what those three bytes are gonna be about. ABC.Z is gonna be here, dot Y is gonna be here, dot X is gonna be here. And that's my only local variable. So that means after allocation, the stack pointer should point to the beginning of the variable ABC, which is a local variable. Are there any questions about this picture here? which is you know, what I want the stack to look like after all the local variables are allocated. Do we have any questions about that? ABC is our only local variable in this case. And it takes up three bytes because there are three members and each member takes up one byte. Are we okay so far? Okay, <laughs> so if there are no questions, then I'm going to continue with this code. And you know, typically, what I what I do is I am going to handle the return first, and then I go back to do the allocation and the deallocation. So since I do have one local variable here, so I'm going to say hmm, we have one local variable ABC. It is going to have an offset of zero from where the stack pointer points to because we want things to happen like this, right? So that the stack pointer points to the local variable that we have. So the local variable is gonna have an offset of zero from where the stack pointer points to. So this zero is basically the address of local variable ABC minus the stack pointer. But since the stack pointer is pointing to ABC, so this whole thing becomes a zero. And since this is the only local variable that we have, so when I need to calculate how many bytes I need to allocate for the entire, for all the local variables, yeah, it is just going to be main ABC, um, nope, take it back, main LVS. What does LVS stand for again? It's a, an abbreviation of Local variable size, very good. So it is just main ABC, which is my first and last local variable because it is the only local variable here, plus the size of ABC. So what should I use here? I need. I know I have a plus, but what should I type You know where the bl blinky cursor is? Exactly, X underscore size. Now we know it is three, but I'm not gonna type a three here because I don't want to have to change all those changes, all the references to the size that are literal integers. I want to use the symbolic name of the size of X whenever it's possible. 
Okay, so this way, if I want to change the structure, I don't have to spring, I, have, I don't have to find all those places to change. So that's why I put an x underscore size here. And that would be the number of bytes I need to allocate at this point. Okay, so with all of this defined, I can now say, mm, let's go ahead and do some allocation. So the allocation is done by, this code is not new, you have seen this already, okay? This is how we allocate, and this is how we deallocate. So just reading this code and memorizing this code is not going to help you. You have to understand why subtracting from the stack pointer is allocation and why adding the same amount to the stack pointer is deallocation. That goes all the way back to the first time when we talked about the stack. Okay, it all has to do with how do we allocate one byte in order to push one byte on the stack, and how do we pop that one byte? Okay, so you have to go all the way back to that discussion to understand why if we want to allocate multiple bytes, we just say, let's go ahead and subtract this many bytes from the stack pointer. If we want to deallocate, this is how we do it. We just add that many bytes back to the stack pointer. Are we doing okay so far at this point? Now, allocation is not the same thing as pushing because pushing is allocation and initialization. We know the value of those locations. That's pushing. Popping is not the same thing as deallocation. Popping is kind of like retrieve the value first and then deallocate. So that means this is without initialization. This is also without any retrieval, okay? because this is exactly what the C compiler does. And that is why when you use local variable and you do not initialize the local variables, the value of the local variables is, can be anything. So if you have an 8-bit unsigned integer as a local variable, it can be one of the 256 possible value. Okay? This is somewhat unique to C and C++. If you program in other programming languages like Python, JavaScript, um, even Java, okay, um, when you allocate for a local variable, there's a, there's a specific value in the variable already. Even in JavaScript, JavaScript is, um, is a weakly typed programming language, which means when you allocate for a local variable, you are not even telling the programming language what kind of value it's supposed to store but it already has a value in it. That value is actually called undefined. But it is a value, <laughs> okay? So if you're, if you're a little bit suspicious of that, I can illustrate it in, I mean, that, it, it won't take long. This is exactly what, I, what I'll do, okay? So node is, allows me to kind of experiment with JavaScript interactively. Let is how we declare a local variable. So I'm going to declare local variable x here, and I will say, okay, tell me what is x. Um, so um, I think um, console.log, console.log will give me the value, and you can see, okay, it says undefined twice, because the first undefined is the actual value of x, the second undefined is the return value of console.log itself. So that's why you know, undefined is mentioned twice. But undefined is a very specific value that you can compare to, but you have to be careful of how you compare to undefined. I'm not gonna get into that discussion because that's a rabbit hole. I can go on and on and on you know, with that particular rabbit hole, which is not related to what we are talking about here. So I'm just gonna say you know, with other programming languages, as soon as you declare a local variable, there is a specific value. But in C and C++, it can be anything. Okay, just keep that in mind. All right, so getting back to our program. So now that I have allocated and deallocated the code, the, the local variables, I can now go here, and it is finally time to get to line 15. Line 15 says, you know, we want to put a value of five into member Y of the structure ABC, or the variable ABC, which is of the type struct X. Okay, that's a long sentence to say, but it is necessary. The five is easy. LDA5, okay, LDIA5, 
That's the right-hand side of the assignment. Super easy. On the other side, maybe we should get to ABC first, okay? So to get to ABC, we say, okay, use another register, main ABC. So at this point, AB, uh, register B has the offset of local variable ABC from where the stack pointer points to. I intentionally did not type the comment because I think you should do it, okay? So I will give you the code, and some of it is already commented, okay? So I'm not gonna comment this particular one because I think it is helpful for you to go over this entire program and identify what each line is trying to do. But I don't want you to be just copying whatever I'm saying here. I want you to kind of understand what I'm trying to say and ask questions when you do not quite understand what I'm saying. Okay, so that's the purpose of the, the lecture. All right, so this is just an offset. So the way we turn an offset into an address is to simply add the stack pointer back to the offset, okay, which is actually explained earlier. This means it doesn't matter what kind of a variable it is. If it is a um, very, if, okay, it doesn't even matter whether it is a parameter versus a local variable, okay? As long as I have a label that is defined to be the offset, from where the stack pointer points to, to that thing, it's the same mechanism to get back to it, okay? So after the add instruction, register B has the address of local variable ABC, which is kind of what we need, but not exactly what we need, because we are not putting the five to the entire variable ABC. I'm only putting the five into member Y, of the structure. So once I have the address of the structure, which I do now in register B, I need to add the offset between the beginning of the structure and member Y to what is, what is in register B already. So I can use register C for this purpose. So now I can do LDI C with the offset from the beginning of a struct X to member Y of that same structure. What label definition did I use for that? X underscore Y, very good, okay? So this is the offset from the beginning of a structure to member Y of the same structure. So I just have to add B and C together. So now B is the address of member Y of the structure that we know as variable ABC. Okay, which is great because it's exactly the byte at that location that I want to change to a five. So STBA is gonna finish the job. All right, so let me double check. The recorder is on, so it is everything is being recorded. Okay, so that means you can go through the recording slowly. You use a lot of pausing in order to take notes and add comments to this program. And also observe the trace at the same time, you know, because you know, I cannot do the trace and explain this at the same time, but when you're watching the video, you would have seen the trace already, you would have the trace next to this source code, so you can then you know, comment on both, okay? Comment on the program, the code itself, and also the trace, because the trace is telling you at runtime what is in each particular register and which location of RAM we are changing. So it is important to also relate what we are talking about here to the trace itself. All right, so that implements line 15. Let's go ahead and do line 16, okay? So line 16 is kind of fun, okay? Because you know, we have to get to the address of member Z of the variable ABC, which is of type struct X, okay? That's kind of what we need to do, we need to push that on the stack and then do the usual call and return. Okay, so let's, have, let's see how we can do that. So let's go to um, ABC first, okay? So we are gonna do about the same thing. So now I have the address of ABC in register D, but I don't want the address of the entire thing, I want the address of member Z. So I'm gonna do the LDI C X Z here and then do an add BC. Okay, I'm gonna pause here because I think this is 
not the best use of resources. In other words, I think there's a way to do this a little bit quicker and accomplish exactly the same thing. Main underscore ABC is a constant. It is a label definition. It doesn't change at runtime. Um, X underscore Z also does not change at runtime. It is just a constant. So if you think about what we are really adding, we are adding main underscore ABC, a constant, to the stack pointer, which is not a constant, to X underscore Z, which is a constant again. So you have two constants and one register value that is not a constant. So if you use um, algebra, you can manipulate the ordering of the addition, and you can put the two constants next to each other. So when two constants add, you have another constant that does not change at runtime. So if it doesn't change at runtime, you don't have to recompute it all the time, you know, again and again. I can pre-compute the sum of the two constants and just add the stack pointer to that single constant in this case. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me let me write that you know, down in comments. Okay, what we are trying to do is to figure out what is main ABC plus D plus main. I mean, excuse me, y x underscore z. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. But you guys already know in algebra you can move things around a little bit because of the rule of commutation, right? So that means I can now group these two and say, hey, both of these are constants. So the entire thing does not change over time. I can just pre-compute this entire thing and put it into a register and call it a day. Does that make sense? So that means I can now do something like this, okay? Get rid of this, and we're done. We accomplished exactly the same thing as what we had earlier, but it saved us two instructions. <clears throat> Yes. Can we do it with? Yes, we could have. Yep. I intentionally introduced introduced that piece of code without using this trick because I want that explanation to be really more step by step. You know what components are needed in order to compute the address of a member of a object that is a local variable. So, but in this case, I want to introduce the optimization because I go like, hey, I can group things in, slightly, in a slightly different order and save myself you know, two additional uh, instructions. So you are correct. I could have applied exactly the same thing earlier. Cool, okay. So now register B is the address of member Z of the structure of the variable ABC that is of the type of struct X. Okay, so we got everything already. What is left is to push it on the stack. Decrement D, STB, oh, DB. Ah, there we go. Push it on the stack because it's my argument. And now we have to call the function. So calling a function means I have to push the return address. And then a JMPI to the function that we're calling, which is init zero. When it comes back, I will still have the argument sitting on the stack, which I don't need anymore. So I just do an increment D to get rid of the argument that is still sitting on the stack. So that means from line 50 to line 62, they are all implementing line 16 of the C code. Do we have any questions about that? about how line 16 of the C code is implemented. So right now, you have to kind of focus on the concept first. The detail, if you understand the concept, you can actually reproduce the, uh, the detail, the actual code, and it's all getting recorded anyway, and I will send you the source code. So don't worry about you know, the details, but do you understand the concept? Okay, all right. So now we move on to the last one. So we have um, abc.y on the right-hand side, abc.x on the left-hand side. So I'm gonna do this one also with a trick, okay? So it's all about these tricks. The reason why I give you all of these tricks here 
is there are different ways to get the same thing done. And I want you guys to understand that, oh, okay, so there's another way to get this done. And how is this method the same as that method? I want you to kind of think about that, okay? Because that's how, this is how we train ourselves not to think in a box, okay? That whole phrase of thinking in a box or thinking out of a box, guess who, who put that box in our head or in our mind? Ourselves. Because we only think, oh, that's, this is the way to do. This is, we don't think of this is a way of doing it. We think of this is the way of doing it. That is how the box happens. So as long as we don't think that way, as long as every time I introduce a method to get something done, you say, oh, this is a way of getting it done, then you don't have a box because you are now open to, hmm, there may be some other way to get the same thing done, possibly even faster, okay? So that's how we stop putting that box on our head. Now, if you ask, does, does tech have a thinking box? The answer is yes, everybody has one, okay? The idea is try not to you know, make that box smaller <laughs> or regular size anyway. So I think my thinking box is he still here. It's just you know, of a very irregular you know, shape. When people think, you know, you probably were thinking like this. No, it's not. And, and then it's restrictive in some other way when other people are more flexible. Okay. So now we want to get uh, line 17 done. Okay. So this time we're going to do it in a slightly different way. So we're going to do LDI um, eh, A, okay, uh, main underscore ABC add AD, okay? So now we have the address of ABC as a variable in register A already. We need to get to Y, okay? So what I'll do is I'm going to do something a little bit kind of funky, okay? So we'll do LDI B with um, x underscore y, which is the offset to member y from the beginning of the whole structure. And then we're gonna do add b a, okay? So now register b is the address of member y of abc, which is of the type struct x. And we need a dereference because we don't want the address of y, we want the value of y. So we now need a dereference. So I will do ld and I will make this uh, c, oh, b, c, b, okay? So I put it into the third register that I have access to. So um, one thing that you might want to do is to try to figure out which register has what at this point of time, okay, on line 68. Register A has the address of the variable, which is ABC. Register B has the offset, has the address of member Y, of the variable ABC, and the register C has the value of a member Y of the variable ABC, okay? So that's, and when we run this code, you can actually see it, because you actually get to see the content of each register, so when you go to the memory map of the entire thing, you can actually go like, oh, okay, I can see exactly how this is happening, okay? So now we have the right-hand side. Now I need to deal with the left-hand side, which is, okay, let's compute the address of X and you know, finish up this entire operation. So I'm gonna do something that's kind of awkward here. It's totally not efficient, but it gets the same thing done, okay? But I do want to do it this way just so that you guys go like, oh, so that's how we do it. So now we're gonna put something into register A, which is the um, offset between the offset to, um, the difference between the offset to X and the offset to Y. I do a subtraction here. So once again, this is postfix notation. This means XX minus XY, okay? That's just a postfix notation. So now I say, let's add this to register B. And I claim that register B now has the address of member X of the variable ABC. Now, is this really more efficient than the other way? No, but is this another way to get the same thing done? Yes, it is, okay? Let's think about, you know, just kind of walk this through, you know, with a dry run, okay? 
xx is defined to be zero, xy is defined to be one. Zero minus one is negative one, all right? So we are basically subtracting one from register B. Register B has the address of member Y of ABC. Where is X again relative to Y? It's one byte below it. So by subtracting one from the address of Y, we get back to the address of X. Okay, so it should work, okay? So that means what, what is left is to store to member X of ABC with whatever is the value of Y, which is already in register C. So that should accomplish the entire thing. And then we do the deallocation of the local variables. And then we do the return back to the entry code. And that should accomplish the entire thing. So now it's almost time to run this code, but not quite yet. Because what the next thing I want to do is to say, when I run this code, what is where in memory? I want to figure it out ahead of time. So this way, when I look at the trace of the code, I can start to explain. It's like, oh, okay, I can see how this is blah, and this is blah, and so on and so forth. Okay, so do, to do that part, I am going to switch back to, uh, where's my, oh, right here. Okay, it's already here, okay. <clears throat> so I want to take a look at what is on the stack when this entire program is running, okay? So I'm going to use this portion here to represent the entire stack. This is location FF. This is FE, FD, FC, FB. I don't think I need any more than this, but you know, we'll just go ahead and, oh, we actually need more than that. FA. F9, and I think we, we have enough now. Uh, what do you think is at location FF? Okay, let me go back and show you the code. And I have to go all the way back to, be, to the beginning. So what do you think is at location FF, which is the very first thing that we push when we, ran, when we run this code? So it's a return to the entry code. The, the entry code does not have a name, but it would be the return address, right? Okay, so you are correct. So that means you know, this location is going to be the return address to the entry code. Okay, so I'm just going to say entry code here, okay? What about, and then what did, we, what did we do? So let me see if you guys can remember you know, what we did in the assembly code. So after we push the return address, then what did we do? We do a JMPI to main, and, and at the entry point of main, what did we do? So we allocated for local variable ABC, okay? So we have ABC dot, okay? So I'm gonna let you guys tell me what members of ABC are in these three locations. Let's start with this one. What should it be? Z, very good, okay? Followed by Y, followed by X. Okay, very good. So the call frame for main would be these four bytes. These four bytes are basically the call frame of main. They provide the context for function main to operate. Are we good so far? Okay. Um, and then we perform some operation. I think we initialize Z first or Y. We initialize Y with a five, okay? So that means you know, the five should go here. The, the value of five should go here. And then we called init zero. So when we called init zero, how did we use the stack? What is the first thing that we push on the stack when we called init zero? It needs one parameter, okay? Let me go back to this, to the code. So look at the C code, okay? The C code is a whole lot easier to understand. So when we called init zero, what did we pass? What is that? The address of member Y of ABZ. So if, you, if I switch back to the map of memory, 
Which location is that? But where is y? Is f, fd is what we push because we're pushing the address, not the value. Oh, we are pushing z, we're pushing z, you're correct. We're pushing z and that would be f e, that's correct, okay. So this is gonna be the address of abc.z, which is hexadecimal f e. That is pushed first. And then what, what we pushed? What did we push? The return address. Okay, very good. So this is another return address. So this is as far as we went in terms of using up the stack. All right, so when we are in the subroutine, we use the address of Z to change it to a zero. And then we return using the return address, we return and then upon returning, we use an increment D to deallocate the location of FB so that the stack pointer goes all the way back up to FC. And then at that point, we calculate the address of, I think, uh, the address of Y, which is uh, FD. And then we retrieve the value of five into register C, if I remember correctly. And then we calculate the address of X of uh, ABC and then change that to a 5-2. So that would be kind of the sequence of how things happen in this case. Do we have any questions about how I kind of try to predict you know, what is going to happen to the memory content of TTP? I know this is a lot, okay, you know, but generally speaking, are we understanding the, the general idea of how this program executes? Okay, we good? Okay, so now it is time to actually run it. So we'll go back to the command line here. I'm gonna save it first because that's my favorite thing to do is forgetting to save it. And then I'll run it in a separate window because I need to change the folder to uh, River Spider. So documents, CISB 310, River Spider. So if you have not installed and configured uh, Reefer Spider, I highly suggest that you do it, and it can take a long time, okay? So, um, you know, I wouldn't do it in the lab because it, it takes, <laughs> it can take half an hour just to decompress that one thing. So, all right, so the file is called struct.ttpasm. So we'll take a look. <clears throat> If you don't use Rifle Spider, you can still get it done. It's just a little bit more cumbersome. And I think I have demonstrated how to do it without Rifle Spider already in a previous class and also in the separate video. All right, so it's all good. And I'm going to switch back to the assembler as long as soon as this part is done. Okay, so we go switch back to the assembler. Now would be assuming this is working, you know, then someone can take a snapshot and share that link with uh, the rest of the class later, or you can do it yourself. All right, so looks like the program ran. So the first thing I want to check to see whether the program actually ran correctly or not is I'm going to skip all the way to the bottom and see whether I ended up at the halt instruction. This is a good sign. And also to check whether the stack pointer is back to zero, zero. So they're both correct in this case. So I'm fairly certain the program does not have any major problem. So now the question is, okay, tell me exactly what is happening when the program ran. I mean, this is literally just reading line by line and go back and explain you know, what each instruction is actually doing in the source code except this is the runtime behavior, which means we actually do have a specific stack pointer to look at. All right, this is the initialization. This is pushing the return address on the stack. And so location FF now has the return address of 09. In other words, I'm expecting the halt instruction to be at location 09. Now, how do we double check and make sure? We go to the assemble window. We go all the way down to the halt instruction. Well, actually, right, it's not all the way down, it's right here. <laughs> it is at location 09, okay? So that's how we can double check. So between the analysis and the assemble tab, you can actually figure out a lot of things about how a program ran. Um, 
This is also how you're going to debug programs. And this is also the reason why I did not give you any actual programming until now, because I want you guys to kind of know how to read a trace because before you start to write your code, because this can tell you a lot of information. When your program doesn't work, this is where you can spot and go like, hey, I'm expecting this value to be over here, but why is it something else? Stop right there, because you know, that's where the bug is. Or you know, that's at least where the symptom is. Okay. So then we continue execution at main, and you can also tell that the line number has changed to line 40, because that is main. And then we load the value of three, you know, because that's the number of bytes we need to allocate on the stack. And then we decrement, we subtract that much from the stack pointer. So the stack pointer went from FF to FC um, because we you know, decrease it by three. So that's you know, the allocation. So FC, if you go back to, um, where's my super note right here. So this is FC. FC is indeed the beginning of the frame corresponding to main. So this is important, okay? Being able to cross-reference the source code, which describes how to do things, the trace, exactly what is done, and also what I anticipate is going to happen on, you know, in the, on the stack. You know, making references between all three is important, okay? So that's how I would, quote, unquote, study for this class at this point is really going through all this stuff here interactively. All right, so now we go back here and then we say, okay, what are we gonna do next? We are supposed to change um, member Y to a five, okay? The five is easy. We just use the LDI to put the five into register A. This is the offset of local variable ABC from where the stack pointer points to. In other words, the stack pointer is pointing to local variable ABC because it is the only variable in this entire function. So adding zero to the, to adding the stack pointer to zero means it's just a stack pointer, but this is now treated as the address of ABC. This is the offset to member Y from the beginning of a struct X, which is one byte off. And then when we add that one byte to the FC, we get to FD. So FD should be the address of member Y of local variable ABC, which is of the type struct X. Um, how do we check that? How do we check that? Can we check that? Have I worked this out? Okay, let me ask the question again. The question is, if I were to add comments to this entire thing, I would have said slash slash b is now the address of member y of the, of the variable abc, which is of the type struct x, which is fd. So have I already worked out something from earlier that fd should be the address of member y? I think I did on the tablet, okay? So Let's go check that, okay? So we check this, and we lo look up location FD. It is indeed supposed to be member Y of ABC. This is important, okay? I know it sounds awfully tedious that you have to work out how memory is going to be used ahead of time, go through the trays, dig through the trays, and go like, okay, we're supposed to have the address of blah, blah, blah in register blah at this point. But this is how we debug programs when you're writing programs in assembly, okay? You really have to go through this step-by-step step and kind of double check, okay? Do I have the right content in the register at this point? And I just double checked and it is correct, okay? All right, so what else are we doing? Okay, we go back to the trace. The next thing we do is to store the five you know, to that location, which is reflected by column C. So in this case, column C is saying that we are storing a value of hexadecimal 05 to the location FD. Okay, we just did that. Okay, so this is, this is all happening the way that we expect it to be happening. Is that okay so far? Okay. Um, so fast forward, do you want me to really kind of go through this step by step or do you want me to fast forward a little bit here? 
fast forward? Okay, no, not, not fast? Okay, so the next one is to, um, we have to call init zero with the address of member Z of the variable ABC, which is of the struct, which is of type struct X. This is the offset. This is adding the stack pointer. The bottom line is FE should be the address of member Z of variable ABC that is of the type struct X. The question is, is it? Well, yep, got it, okay? So when we called the subroutine, okay, so now we have to say, let's uh, push it on the stack, okay? So now we push the address of member Z of ABC on the stack. After that, we push the return address on the stack. This is the return address. So did we anticipate that location FA should be used to store the return address from init zero back to main? Well, I have to double check. This is FA. It is the return address. So everything is still matching, okay? But if you say, but Tech, how do we know that 2B is the correct return address? Maybe we push something on the stack, but it's not the return address. That's totally possible, right? So the way we check that 2B is the correct return address is we go to the assemble tab. We go to the assemble tab, and then we get to the point of about, we are about to do the JMPI to init zero, which is here. And this is the location that it has to go back to. The function, is the callee, is always supposed to go back to the location that is right after the JMPI instruction in a call. So yeah, so 2B is the correct return address to get back to. So this is how we, this is how I can double check that the program is working the way it's supposed to every step along the way. The inconsistency can be between I draw this picture, I think I have an understanding of how the program is supposed to work, which location of memory is supposed to be doing what. This part can be correct, but the implementation of the program is incorrect. So it's, as soon as I notice any discrepancy between what I expect the program to do and the, what the program is actually doing, which is the trace, which is the analysis tab of the assembler, then I should stop right away and ask, how does this happen? Why is there a discrepancy between what I expect the program to do and what it actually does? It can be because of three reasons, okay? One, my theory is correct, but my implementation is incorrect. It can be because my theory is wrong, but the implementation is right. It can also be because the theory and the implementation are both wrong in different ways, okay? But every time you see a discrepancy, it's time to stop, back up, okay, and try to figure out why is there a discrepancy here? And then double check everything to make sure that you understand why it is happening and fix the problem. All right, so I'm, I'm telling you guys what you need to do to finish the program that is due next Tuesday. Okay, these are the techniques that I personally use to debug my program. It's tedious, okay? There's no quick and easy way to debug programs in assembly. <clears throat> All right, so getting, getting on this, okay? This is the return address. We just push it on the stack, and then we do a jump to the subroutine. And inside the subroutine, this is the offset to get to the parameter from where the stack pointer points to. This is the actual address of the parameter. And this is the value of the parameter and we are changing that location to zero, zero. So now we expect that location to be changed to zero, zero. The question is, um, is that really Z of ABC? We'll double check. So if we go back here, yep. FE is Z of ABC, and it is supposed to be initialized to zero, and it is now initialized to zero. So every step along the way, I am checking, I'm, double checking between the trays and also you know, what I expect to be on the stack. And if anyone is thinking, oh, this is all staged, you know, just like those infomercials, I can tell you it is not. <laughs> all the sample programs are created on the fly in lecture. You know, now, if it just so happens to resemble a program that I did you know, from the past, it's coincidental. 
In other words, I really did not know whether the program would work or not. I'm checking whether the program is working just as you are, okay? Because this is the process. I want to give you the process of debugging a program, which in the process is also going to help you understand the concepts. Okay, so next, what do we do? This is the return sequence. We are now retrieving the return address, which is 2B. We deallocate the return address, so the, the stack pointer is now pointing one location higher, which is the parameter. And then we do the jump to go back to the caller, which is at location 62. The increment D is deallocating the argument that is still sitting on the stack. And the stack after the deallocation, the stack pointer points to FC. So now let's go back to the map and check whether that is reasonable or not. You can see how the argument is using location FB. FC is where the stack pointer should be because we are now back in main. And if we're back in main, the stack pointer should point to the only local variable on the stack, which starts at location FC. Okay? So FC is the correct value for the stack pointer. All right, so what do we do next? We, uh, we compute the address of ABC. We get the offset between the beginning of ABC as a structure and member Y. And then we add those two so that we get to the address of Y. And then we retrieve whatever is at the address of Y. So at this point, it should be a five, okay? So it should be a five here at location FD. We double check, okay? So we can see that we retrieve the value at location FD and it is indeed a five. So five is now in register C. This is loading the number of bytes between member X and member Y of the same structure and therefore the subtraction. It is negative one, but it's gonna show as FF in hexadecimal. Okay, so that's what it is, okay? So this one goes all the way back to signed number representation. So all of the topics that we talk about in this class, they're all interconnected in some way. And then we add A, which is negative one, to register B, which is FD. So we are basically essentially subtracting one from register B, which has a value of FD, FD right now. So it should become FC after the subtraction. That should be the address of member X of ABC because that's uh, FC is right here. It is supposed to be the address of abc.x, which it is. And now we store register C, which has a value of five, to whatever B is pointing to. Register B is the address of member X of ABC, and that location should now change to a five. We go back to the map and say, is that supposed to happen? Yep, it is supposed to happen. So getting back to the assembler, now we are done with the entire program. We deallocate the local variables by adding three to the stack pointer. So the stack pointer changed from, okay, when was the last time it was updated? Up here. So it changed from FC all the way back to FF, okay? What is supposed to be at FF, okay? Because we are not deallocating to that location, which means it is still of value. Looks like we are using it as a return address. Is it a return address? We go back to the map, double check, right? It is indeed the return address to the entry point of the entire program. So we retrieve that, it is at 09. Is that the actual return address? Well, let's double check. Go to the assemble view, go to location nine, and ask the question, is this location where main is supposed to return to? The answer is yes, because it is right after the JMPI to main, so this is the correct location to return to. And we get we, de, we increment D so that we deallocate the return address. This is done by main itself. The uh, stack pointer becomes zero, zero, and then we jump, and then we get back to the halt instruction, and that concludes the execution of this entire program. All right, so it is a lot, okay? And this is also why I record the lectures, okay? Because you're supposed to be spending two times the amount of time in lecture in other activities in order to understand the material and also practice. And depending on the individual, okay, some people may need 
30 minutes additional to get everything done. Some people may need an hour and a half. I do not know how much time you will need, okay? But you need to spend some time, okay? Everybody will have to spend some time to kind of go through this material and comment both the trace and also the program to get a full understanding of what happened in this program. And we do have a lab today, okay? So in addition to the homework assignment, we do have a lab today. The lab today is um, basic structures. This is basically the same thing that we talked about in this class, except you know it is in the form of a quiz. So let me unhide it. And then the access code to this lab is, not surprisingly, struct. So I'll see you guys over at the lab in a few minutes. <laughs>